Lisa. Hi, Lisa. <laughs> I didn't really get to talk to you yet. There's my hype. I don't say anything else to you the rest of the day. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's good to see you here this morning. Uh, we were going to sing Trading My Sorrows. Who doesn't want sorrows? And if you do, you need to give them to Jesus. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, let's all stand. I'm trading my sorrows. I'm trading my shame I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord I'm trading my sickness I'm trading my pain I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord Yes Lord, yes Lord, yes, yes Lord Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen, I'm trading. I'm trading my sorrows. I'm trading my shame. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sickness. I'm trading my pain I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord yes Lord we're singing yes Lord yes Lord yes yes Lord yes Lord yes Lord yes yes Lord yes Lord yes Lord yes yes Lord amen yes Lord we're singing yes Lord yes Lord yes yes Lord Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. I am pressed but not crushed, persecuted, not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. I'm blessed beyond the curse, for his promise will endure. This joy is going to be my strength. Though sorrow may last for the night, Joy comes in the morning. I'm trading my sorrows. I'm trading my shame. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sickness. I'm trading my pain. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. We're singing, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. Yes, Lord. We're singing, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, 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 Lord. Amen. Sorry. I am pressed. I am pressed but not crushed, persecuted, not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. I'm blessed beyond the curse, for his promise will endure, his joy is going to be my strength. Though sorrow may last for the night, his joy comes in the morning. I'm trading my sorrows, I'm trading my shame. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sickness. I'm trading my pain. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. Yes, Lord. We're singing, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, amen, yes, Lord. We're singing, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, amen. Have you all traded your sorrows for the joy of the Lord today? Amen. If not, today's a good day to start, amen? Amen. Amen. Welcome to Prairie Temple. 
Thank you for joining us this morning. I am looking forward to today's service. I hope everyone out there is. Um, I just want to thank everybody, encourage everybody to go back and look at the Pastor Appreciation Board that uh, we put together and back. There's a few pictures to add yet, um, but thank you everybody who has participated and brought in pictures. Um, I think it's looking great, and it is a great tribute to um, our pastors, both past and present. Um, so when you get a chance, go back there and take a look at it, okay? Um, anyway, let's open the service in prayer. Father God, we just thank you for your presence in this place this morning, Lord. Lord, we ask you to just flood this place this morning with your spirit. May it uh, find its place in the hearts of every single person present here this morning, Lord Father. Lord, we ask that you be with Pastor Scott this morning. Uh, help him to provide the message, Lord, that you would have us here today. Be with us throughout the rest of the service, Lord Father God. Be with us during our worship and our praise, Lord. For there is none other than you who deserves our praise, Lord Father. Once again, be with us throughout this service, Lord Father God. And may your peace flood this place this morning. Amen. How many want the spirit of the, of the living God to rest on you? Amen. It's a good place. Amen. Amen. <laughs> As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will move me. Come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. was moving over the water spirit come move over us come rest on us come rest on us as the spirit was moving over the water spirit come move over us come rest on us come rest on us come down spirit when you move you make my heart pound when you fill the room you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will feel me calm down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will feel me. do it again open up the gates let heaven on in come rest on us come rest on us fire and wind come and do it again open up the gates let heaven on in come rest on us come rest on us come down spirit will you move you make my heart pound when you fill the room you're here and I know you are moving I'm here and I know you will fill me Come down Spirit when you move you make my heart pound When you fill the room You're here and I know you are moving I'm here and I know you will fill me You're all we want. You're all we want. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. You're all we want. Holy
you're all we want. Oh, Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. Oh, Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. Come down. Spirit, will you move? You make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. You're all we want, oh Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want, you're all we want, oh Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want, you're all we want. Let your holy water fill this place. God, I'm on my knees again. God, I'm begging, please, again. I need you. Oh, I need you. Walking down these desert roads, water for my thirsty soul. I need you. Oh, God, I need you. Your forgiveness like sweet sweet honey on my lips it's like the sound of a symphony to my ears it's like holy water on my skin dead man walking slave to sin i want to know about born again. I need you. Oh God, I need you. Take me to the riverside. Take me under baptized. I need you. Oh God, I need you. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Like the sound of a symphony to my ears. It's like holy water on my skin. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really Makes me want to change your forgiveness. It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears. It's like holy water. Your forgiveness. It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Like the sound of a symphony to my ears. It's like holy water on my skin. It's like holy water on my skin. It's like holy water.
Lord, speak your name. It's all about you, Lord. Speaking the name of Jesus. It's what we need to do each and every moment. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name Jesus till every dark addiction starts to break declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus your name is power your name is healing your name is light. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over fear and all depression I speak Jesus your name is power your name is healing your name is life break every stronghold shine through the shadows burn light your name is power your name is power your name is healing your name is life break every stronghold shine through the shadows burn like a fire Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness, over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Your name is power, your name is healing, your name is love. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. Your name is power. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. You break every stronghold, you shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Every, every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I 
your name today because it holds so much power. It holds ultimate power. And we just worship you right now in this holy place. Glory to your name. Hallelujah. Amen. I was trying to speak the name of Jesus during that song, but I got a frog in my throat halfway through. So, but I declare the name of Jesus over this place this morning. Our prayer list this morning, we have um, Carolyn, this is Tangie's friend, if I'm reading that right, Uh, Josh and family, this is Betty's grandson, Sandra, this is Marlene's sister, Uh, Gary Miner and Jim Renfro need your prayer this morning. Um, I do not, I haven't got a good update on Gary, so I do not know what's going on there. Jim is um, recovering from surgery. Uh, prayer request for Tara Robinson and Peggy Whitler. I know Peggy was in the hospital earlier in St. Louis this week. And Sandy's uncle passed away. So let's keep that family in our prayers this morning. Uh, perhaps you have a prayer request this morning that you would like to signify by raising your hand. If you do, God knows you. you. He knows your request. And uh, he is already working towards that. I firmly believe that. Let's take these requests before the Lord this morning. Lord, Father God, we just, we welcome you into this place, Lord. Lord, we speak your name this morning, Lord, for there is no other name but the name of Jesus, Lord, that saves. No other name but the name of Jesus, Lord, that heals. I believe, Lord, that when you went to the cross, you went to the cross not only for our salvation, Lord, Father God, but for our good, for our healing, Lord, <clears throat> so that uh, when we have a need, Lord, that we can cry out to you, Lord, Father God, and that you will look after us, you will take care of us, Lord, Father. It's in your, it's in your name, Lord, Abba, Abba, Father, Lord. A father looks after his children, Lord, Father. And we trust in you, Lord, that you're going to look after us, that you only have our best uh, needs, Lord, not once, but our best needs at heart, Lord, Father. Lord, we ask that you be with this list of prayer requests this morning, Lord, for Carolyn, Tangie's friend, and for Josh and his family, Lord. We ask that you be with them for whatever their need is, Lord, Father, God. I believe Josh is traveling, Lord. They are relocating, Lord. We just ask that Your presence go before them, Lord, Father God, and that um, wherever they're relocating to, Lord, that that you'll be able to uh, surround that family with people, Lord, uh, that you would have them meet, Lord, Father God, that that, uh, would be a good Christian influence to them, Lord, Father, while they're there uh, forever, however long that would be, Lord, and they find a good family, Lord, down there, they have family here, Lord. But when there's distance between family like that, Lord, you put other people in in, in our paths to help us um, to help us cope with distance between lost love between loved ones. And we just trust that that you'll do that in this case, Lord Father God. That you'll put people uh, around this family, surrounding them, Lord Father God, to let them know that even though family is here wherever they're at lord they have family there as well too uh for marlene sister sandra lord uh, for tara robinson and peggy lord for whatever they're going through at this moment lord father god we just trust that you will mend their bodies lord um i know peggy was in the hospital i don't know if she's still there lord father god but we speak your peace and your healing over her lord father god she is 
a strong soul and a strong saint that has served you for as long as I can remember, Lord, Father God. From the moment I first met her, she has never been able to declare you, Lord, Father God. I'm sure she's doing that right now, wherever she is at. And we thank you for her, Lord, Father God. And we trust that uh, she will be back with us soon. For those recovering from surgery, Lord, Father God, we just... Uh, Thank you, Lord, that surgeries were, were successful and that uh, we trust that they will recover fully, Lord, and be stronger than ever before. And for those who have lost loved ones, Lord, Father, we just speak your peace over these families, Lord, Father, God. We speak just, I, I know I, I say it a lot, Lord, Father, God, but we want joy and remembrance, Lord, as they reminisce, reminisce about these these individuals, Lord, let them find joy in their memories, Lord, Father God. Let them find peace in their memories. We just celebrate you, Lord, Father God, today. We are thankful for your presence in this place, Lord, Father. We are thankful for what you do in our lives every single day. Lord, we just ask that whenever anything occurs in our life, Lord, Father God, that takes our eyes from you, whenever we try to find healing or comfort or joy in any other means, in any other form, Lord, Father God, we would just ask that you show that to us as, as it is, Lord, Father God. It's, it's idolatry, Lord, for lack of a better term. I truly believe that. <clears throat> anything that we look to as a solution other than you, Lord, Father God, if you haven't put it there for us, it's a form of idolatry. And I would just ask, Lord, that, that you make us aware of this <clears throat> because I believe right now, Lord, that there's a form of that going on in this community right now, Lord, Father. And we speak against that, Lord, Father God. Be with our community. Be with uh, this town, Lord, this surrounding area, Lord, this state, even this country, Lord, Father God, let us turn our eyes toward you for all our needs, Lord Jesus. It's in your son's precious and holy name, Lord, Father God, we pray. Amen. Um, real quick, before I hand it over to Derek, <clears throat> men's group, you guys know we have a men's ministry in this church, right? I speak about it a lot. Um, it's kind of, you know, I won't say it's an official men's ministry, but um, I tell you what, guys, I enjoy meeting with you, and I would love to see more of you come to our group meetings. Tuesday night, we are starting a new Bible study on the book of Esther. So if you want to uh, just learn a little bit, I love the Old Testament because I'm a history kind of guy. So I like going back and reading the history in the Old Testament, so I'm going to enjoy this study. So please come Tuesday night, 7 o'clock, and join us for that. Um, Saturday morning, 7 o'clock, men's prayer breakfast. Uh, we are continuing with our study of every man's battle, so I hope that you can join us for that. Come come have some great food. Well, come have some food. I'm, I usually cook, so <laughs> if, if you don't cook, don't complain. <laughs> But come join us on Saturday morning at 7 a.m. as we continue our study in Every Man's Battle. All right. Thank you, Derek. I don't think it's on. Last week we had a problem, and I think it was because Pastor Corey, I gave him this one, and he turned it on, and they canceled one another out. So that's why I didn't have the, have the mic working. So what I usually say, Jim, is if you come and you didn't help work, don't say a word. If you don't like the decorations in the church, don't say a word. If you don't like what, what we do outside when we do a project, don't say a word because you weren't there to help. So if you want to come and help, then you got everything to say you can complain about and say how the leadership was really bad. <laughs> but what did you do? So, all right, as we prepare for this morning's tithe and offering gathering, and does anybody, my dad shared a word a couple weeks ago, and does anybody have a word where God has blessed you in a time where you, you were having struggling whether to depend on him or not? Anybody? 
wow, we really need to have prayer then. So, well, then I'll share mine. God, I was looking over my, the way things are going for me this year, and I told you a couple months ago, usually the past couple years I've been participating in pumpkin season, and pumpkin season and for the past couple years has really blessed my family. And uh, I didn't know how I was going to get through. If uh, Not that I was really depending on pumpkin season, because I... In our business and in our trucking, things always fluctuate, okay? It goes with everything else. You can't really depend on it having the same every year. Uh, but pumpkin season has really blessed my family the past couple years. And then when things went with Pastor Terry and he went home, one of these days I'm going to be able to get through this. Um, but not yet. So I was like, God, how... I didn't feel I need to be here at church as a responsibility as a board member. But if I'm up there, you gotta work it out. And he has. He has. And so he has. I was looking at our finances the other day, and I'm right on track where I was last year without missing a beat, without having pumpkin money. And I've been home with my family the past couple weeks. If you've seen Facebook, we were out with the family last week, minus Kendrick. I was out with my gal yesterday, going down through uh, the river bottom, looking at the beautiful trees, went through there. God has blessed me, okay? And God will do that for you too. He does. His word says it. And God is not a liar, okay? Understand that God, what God says, he can't go back on his word. What he has he wrote in his word, what has been written in the word that we read, that we hear from day after day after week after week, he doesn't go back on. Because that he, then he has to apologize. And he has to go back and apologize to all those generations from Adam on. And God's not about to apologize. Okay? He is faithful to what he has established in his word. May you find that out. And that we would have more testimonies where God... You know, that's what builds up one another. Okay? I was listening to a, a podcast by uh, those of you... Matt Holliday, who's a Cardinal baseball player. Him and his wife have a, a wonderful podcast they share. And she was talking about when the body gathers, when we gather on Sundays, this should be a celebration time. Okay, I think even Pastor Scott, I remember him saying years ago, when we come on Sundays, we should celebrate what God has done for us this past week. It may be small increments where you can look back over your past week, but we should. this should be the feeling of heaven in here. When we come and gather, this should feel like heaven. We're a body of believers here to worship God. He comes and he comes in our presence and he gathers with us because this is where two or more agree in my name. He's going to do things and he's going to come and meet with us and he meets with us here. Okay. May God bless you as you give. May you start to form your own testimony. We want to hear it. We want to, there may be somebody on the other side of the building that needs to hear how God helped you. Okay. So, share your testimony when we give the opportunity. May God bless you as you give this morning. The Lord's our rock, in Him we hide, shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever ill be tied, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land. A shelter in the time of storm, a shade by day, defense by night, a shelter in the time of storm. No fears, alarm, no foes of fright, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. All right, now we'll pray over the offering. I know, I throw it up. I change things up. That's okay. It's all right. I know. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time to gather your offering this morning. We pray that you just bless the offering as it gathered this morning. We pray that you bless those who gave. And those who couldn't give, I pray that you, by your power of your Holy Spirit, would encourage them to trust and see that you are good and faithful. 
Father God, we pray your blessing over the rest of the service that you would just lead us and guide us in what you'd have to accomplish. May we take what is being shared with us today to take it to our family members, our co-workers, and anybody else you may bring into our path to share with them the love of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Whew. It's Pastor Appreciation Month. And, uh, oh, before I forget, there is a message on here that says, Choir. They are having choir practice every Sunday morning. Please come and join them in the choir. And they could use all the voices they can have. They can use all the voices that you want to come and sing. They'll put you in a spot. You don't have to sing out loud. Just fill in the, fill in where they need you to fill in. <laughs> you never hear me sing. I just get up there and mouth the words. Watermelon, watermelon, watermelon. Uh, but as I was saying, it's Pastor Appreciation Month, and I've been doing this for longer than I can remember. And uh, can't let it go. So... Before I get into that, does anybody want to say a word? I know you, we shared. I was so happy, to, and I told Debbie this a couple months ago, I was so glad that last October we took a moment like this and got everybody a chance. There's different ones you shared and said what, and Pastor said up here, and he got to listen. And uh, so is there anybody else? They got, you got Shelly, and you got Terry here. So is there something you'd like to say about their dad as Pastor Appreciation, something that we're, and Debbie, and Debbie too, and uh, we want to honor them today. And uh, is there something that you maybe you didn't get to say during the funeral as you're passing by? Because it, it is a time of busyness. Cody. Oh, thank you. All right. So um, I just wanted to say it's been a blessing since we've been back here. Uh, my family and I moved back here in August. And I think it was... God's incredible timing, man. To be here three weeks before Pastor Terry entered into where he is now, um, he gave me a lot of blessings and breakthrough and prayed with me and my wife and, and Miss Debbie did as well before we left. And so um, we're grateful, man. We're excited. Like Derek said, uh, share a good word. And I was in the back. I didn't want to hop up from the, uh, the drum kit, but I have a new job that I'm starting on Tuesday. So I'm super pumped about that. And I, I think... Uh, God is giving us a time of harvest, like you were speaking with pumpkins and, and stuff like that. I mean, we hear about the harvest, but I think that there's been longer than my family's been going here, several generations of people that have sowed good seed, and so I'm excited to see what God's going to do. Amen. Thank you. Anybody else? Did you say it all a couple months ago? Surely not. You thought of something else since then. I do all the time. I thank them for including us as family, but I also thank them. This year they prayed for prodigals. And they saw it before, before he left. My baby and his wife are coming back. And they prayed through their loss, losses. And because of that, Taylor and Isaac believe again. They believe in this church. They feel comfortable in this church. Even Taylor does. And that to me means more than any of you will ever know. And I thank this church, and especially Pastor and Debbie, for believing in missions. Because 
somehow I have to be ready to send my second baby to go to the Philippines or <laughs> Fiji for her career. And I'm not sure how I'm going to do that either. But I don't know who listened, but half of my, half of her first public sermon was about pastor. <laughs> And it was awesome. And it was because of this church who believes in her and prays for her and supports her. And I know they will support her throughout her life and her career and her, in her missions. And I just thank Debbie and Pastor for that and supporting her and knowing that even though she was supposed to be out east for all four years, they let her go to North Central for two and not push her until she heard God and knew where she was supposed to be. Because that's who they are. And that they love us all no matter what. I know you're speechless. <laughs> Anybody else? We got Kleenexes. If you want to cry, cry. Jim. I already told um, Debbie and her family this at the, at the visitation. Um, but when I first started coming to this church, you know, it's, it's hard to believe if you've only known me for the last few years. But I, I was a quiet kind of guy and wasn't involved in, in much. Um, please don't. At that time, you know, please don't ask me to, to start doing solos on piano and speaking in front of people because um, the answer would have been no. Um, Pastor and Debbie encouraged me so much to to get more involved. They they made me more secure in my relationship and my knowledge of Christ and of the Lord uh, to be able to do things like help facilitate men's Bible study in that. But what I really appreciated about Pastor Terry is I knew because, because what, what I try to convey in some of these lessons, I, I won't say that I'm 100% certain about it. Sometimes it's just, hey, while well, I read this, this is what I pictured. <clears throat> and I never had to fear about <laughs> this is this might sound bad but I don't mean it to I, I I never had to fear about giving misinformation because I had pastor as an accountability partner and if I was teaching something or getting along a path that that shouldn't be trod so to speak in in one of these lessons in the most loving, kindest way that I know anybody could do, I would receive correction. And I appreciated that more than anything, knowing that, that I could go in um, and I'd have somebody there to help counsel me during those times to, to make sure that, that what I was passing on needed to be passed on and and what shouldn't be wasn't so all right since you're all so one more person anybody anybody yes hold on let me get the microphone because i don't want you to say something that somebody you've known me ever since you was a kid so you know i've never grown up don't you and oh, inside <laughs> and uh, inside i never grown up yeah. and uh I just want to bless the Lord. I had an 83 birthday this year, and or day this week, and I asked all my kids if they would come and be with me in church this morning, and their most of them is here, and I praise God for them, and they're all Christians. Hallelujah. Praise God. Okay, if nobody else has anything to say, I'll proceed. If I can. My, 
my mom did this. I made a comment to her. Because Pastor Terry talked about, uh, he felt like he was part of the Vanos family. So I said, Mom, you need to adopt him into the Vanos family. So she presented Terry and Debbie with a uh, adoption papers to be an official Vanos. So back the week after the pastor went home, and I was still up in Morton and spending evenings by myself in the hotel room, I'm thinking, okay, I was wanting to do this with him here, but since he went to be part of the heavenly family, <clears throat> certificate of adoption. This certifies that Deborah Lynn Turner from this day forward is being adopted into the families of Prairie Temple Assembly of God. Scripture of 1 John 3, 1, here on October 3rd, 23rd, excuse me, October 23rd, 2022. We will have a sign-up sheet at the back of the church. Okay? So, what I need is everybody to stand up. And if you are willing to adopt Deborah L. Turner into your family, you're going to sign this paper. Just put, you know, the, we're going to put the hinkies. Okay? So, she will... Be a hinky. She will be a Steinocker. She will be a Cruz. She will have your, if you want her last name on here, she is going to be part of your family from now on till, well, we're already family. We're just going to make it official, okay? And thank you, Kendra, for coming up with that idea. I would have just done white paper. She decorated all that and did the nice work. And um, so, raise your right hand. I hereby the congregation of Prairie Temple. Adopt Deborah L. Turner into my family. And I will be by her side in prayer and whatever she may call on me to do. You all are expected to be here for choir next week. <laughs> so I still got to sign the official board. I'll get that to you later. But Debbie, if you would come, we also have a little token for you. And we do, church board, we do need to get a picture later today, so don't duck out until we get our picture. Anne's already on alert, so you're welcome. So. You. you want to say something? <laughs> I wondered why my family was here today. I just thought I was really blessed because Scott and Lisa were here that, that they were here. But um, if Terry were here, he would say, that what he has done and what we have done has been because we love you. We, I receive the adoption. Um, I was thinking earlier, 50 years ago this fall is when we officially began ministry. More than half of that time has been here. We are family. You're welcome, thank you. You may be seated. Tell you what, let's, I should have, while she was here, let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the whole Turner family. You designated, I've been saying, for a time like this, for the past 26 years plus, you have brought them here for that time. And now you have something new planned, and we're trying to be excited for what you have, because we know you don't do things in small ways. You do them in big ways, and we're looking forward to what you have in the days of, for Prairie Temple ahead. Now, may we be faithful in what, you, what you're going to do for us. But during this time, we pray that you continue to be by Miss Debbie's side every moment. And I know you have, because she's testified to me about that. I pray that you would continue to do so and bless their family, bless their extended family. I pray that you bless each and every one of them, minister to them as only you can. You are the only one who can fill the loss of a loved one. When that void is there, it's only by the power of your spirit that comes in and, and fills it. Maybe not only completely, but you know what it does. And we pray that you continue to do that for each and every one of them as they have those moments in the days ahead. 
And uh, for in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes, I thought of this some time ago. So, uh, and I knew I wanted to do it when, at during this month, and it just happened Pastor White was going to be gone. So I asked Debbie, I asked, asked Pastor Sean, and they're on doing pastor appreciation at their church. So he had to be there for that, but he sent Shelly up here to be here this morning. We're so thankful for that. And so then I told Debbie, said, we need somebody to speak on the 23rd. She goes, well, we could do this person. She goes, I could speak. I'm like, all right, that'd be great. We're going to do this. And then she says, well, I can ask Pastor Scott. And I was like, well, that, that's good too. And then she didn't hear from Pastor Scott for a couple of days. I was like, okay. And then she said, Scott's coming. I'm like, okay, great. She goes, God didn't really give me a word. So, well, keep your ears open. So, <laughs> keep your ears open. So, it's, it is wonderful to have the Wades here this morning. Uh, I would say they're spiritual children of the Turners. So it's, if Sean couldn't be, or Sean or Shelly couldn't be here, it's so great to have you here, brother. Come share what God's laid on your heart. And uh, yeah. Bless you, brother. Thank you. Well, good morning. I have to be honest with you, this uh, pastor appreciation part of this has caught me off guard today, and uh, I am just kind of overwhelmed with emotions, so just bear with me today while I get my stuff together, will you? Get my act together. I was kind of nervous about being here anyway. Um, this is another example of, like, I, I've never... I don't know what it is, but I've never been able to tell Debbie no anyway, anytime she ever asked me to do anything. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, it's good to be here. It's fun to come back to one of the few places that I know that when I'm here, it's like being at home. This is one of the few places in my world that it's that way. And uh, it's fun to come back. And I was thinking during worship of all of the different people that we've seen up here on or around this stage at, over the different years playing instruments. And, 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 and even I thought of probably five or six or seven different people at different times who sat behind these drums uh, and, and just played the drums. And that's so cool to just see the the transition and, and the, the family grow and things change and develop and uh, I love that and and then it's also good to come back and see you know just a few things and a few folks who haven't changed a whole lot but uh, some of you you haven't and one of the neat things uh, that I noticed over here in this hallway out b uh, by the offices was that there's a speed the light card that's on the uh, bulletin board out there and I don't know that I put that there but I'm pretty sure that it, it that I either did or it was there the first or second time but it's been there a long time and I thought well some things never change and it's good it's good um, so to be honest with you uh, I, I, I'm just tickled to death to be here today and, and to share with you but I have to confess I was a little slow to respond to Debbie when she texted me to ask to be here this morning. Um, the, the, there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, I waited a day or two before I, I, before I said anything. I didn't say, let me pray about it, because sometimes that can come off kind of weird, like, it sounds like I don't want to be there kind of thing. And so I, I just didn't say anything, which probably turned out looking more rude than anything. And I didn't want to be that way. I wasn't trying to be that way. But I wanted to make sure that if I came, that I wasn't just coming because I was going to get to see a lot of my friends. But I wanted to be sure that the Lord would give me something to share with you today. And uh, I really believe that he's done that. And so, and the other thing was, to be honest, uh, other than in April, when I went back to Carrollton to preach uh, during their 100th anniversary, the week before you folks were there, this is the only time that I've preached uh, since a year ago in July, and I'm feeling like I'm scared, I'm nervous, like I might have some rust going on, 
And uh, so I have all kinds of concerns taking place today. And uh, I just wanted to make sure this was the right thing to do. But I, I believe that the Lord has given me something so that I could say yes and be here today. And it's a joy to be here with you this morning. And uh, the, one of the things that, that puts pause in my heart today, and I am going to share the word, I'm going to share the gospel, but the thing that the Lord put on my heart was to just talk to you a little bit about my journey over the past five or six years. And I know sometimes people are like, well, why are you in Kentucky? You know, what are you doing these days? And, and when a minister uh, resigns from a church, a lot of times it's either because there was tremendous difficulties or tremendous problems and things like that going on, or they're moving on to another ministry assignment. And neither of those things were true for us. And so we just got to this point where we knew that God was transitioning us. There were some things, and I'll share those uh, in a minute that were going on in my life that um, I look back now and I see, okay, I know what God was doing. But I'm kind of here to share my testimony with you today over this short amount of time in my life. And I, and I hope you'll be patient with me. If, if, if you'll be patient with me, uh, I promise you that I will share the gospel, share the word of God, and I will bring it back to a hopeful, redemptive place. Okay? But um, I want to I wanna share with you from Psalm 73 today. I don't have slides to project for you with my, the scriptures. Um, I, was, I, was, I just ran out of time. But if you have your Bibles with you today and you want to go to Psalm 73, that would be a great place for us to begin. I'll touch on a couple other scriptures today. But this is Asaph's psalm. And I don't know if you know much about Asaph, but Asaph was a worship leader. Asaph was, in fact, if you read through the, the Kings and the Chronicles and, 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 and that, the history of of Israel and the, and the monarchs and, and the lineage of David and, and what God was doing. Asaph was one of three Levites that King David chose to set over the worship of Yahweh while he was king. It was a very important position. And yet, as we come to this particular passage today, we're going to see some things uh, that are very interesting. And, and I want you to know... As you look in your Bible, I'm going to be reading from the Passion Translation. I don't know if that's something that any of you are familiar with, but it is a translation that has kind of come into my life in a time that I needed it, that shares the scriptures in just a different way, in a time that I just needed to see some things in a different way. And so I'm going to, I'm going to be reading from the Passion Translation today. But you can read along and follow along, and, and I still think it will minister to your heart. Asaph says in Psalm 73, verses 1 and 2, he says, No one can deny it. God is really good to Israel and to all of those with the pure hearts. Have you experienced the goodness of God in your life? I have been in a handful of different churches now, including this one, and the longer that I have served the Lord, and the longer that I have walked with Him, and as I've gotten married, and we've had kids, and they've grown, and now we've got a, a grandson, I just feel my, like I'm at a place where my heart is full, and I just see the goodness of God so many different places where I look. As I heard so many of you share this morning, it was just like, yeah, there it is. There's more of the goodness of God in, 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 in the family, in the body of God, in, in, the, in the people of God. Asaph says, God really is good. And he kind of makes that statement because it's going to be a foundational for where, where he's going. And he says, God is really good to his people of Israel, and to those with pure hearts. But then he goes on to say, but I nearly missed seeing it for myself. And in verse 2, he says, here's my story. I narrowly missed losing it all. 
I narrowly missed losing it all. Asaph, in the, in the following verses, goes on to explain how he was struggling with how, as he looked around the world about him and, and saw the evil and the wickedness and some of the things that were taking place, how it was beginning to wear on him to the point where it was beginning to affect him on the inside. In fact, it was starting to disrupt the intimacy of the relationship that he had with God. And how many of you know that's a tough place for a worship leader to be? It's a tough place for a pastor to be, for a preacher to be, at a place where you look around and you start to have more questions than you have answers. And I didn't come here today to, uh, to, to, to like be gloomy and to be discouraging and just to like cast shadow and, and stuff like that on the word of God or the faithfulness of God because I could never do that and I would never do that because really at the end of it all this is a story of God's faithfulness and it's a story of his love it's a story of of him penetrating a cloudy place a shadow shadowy place in my life and and helping me to experience that fresh and anew all over again but asaph is kind of saying i'm struggling here asaph fell into a trap that really far too many believers i think fall into he began to look at the sinfulness that was around him look at the abortion issue in america look at the the you know the the, the things that stir us probably as conservative christians up look at you know, just free sin that's just rampant in our culture. We look at the trends in, in our nation. We look at the trends and the discouraging things that are taking place around our world. And they start to weigh on our hearts. And they start to weigh on our spirits. And this is what was happening to Asaph. And you know what I've noticed? As I've noticed, especially when you start to look at Facebook and social media, which I've stopped doing. But I've noticed that so many Christian people, friends of mine, people that I know, that the things that they put out there, you can tell that all of this is starting to weigh on their hearts the same way it was weighing on Asaph's heart because they're starting to get really cranky and angry and bitter and not very Jesus-like. And it just lets me know that our church, the church, is in need of something. I mean, we know that, 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 that Jesus is alive. And, 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 and we know that many times we can come into the house of God and experience Him. We can, we can uh, experience and bless one another. And, and, and we can sing praise. And we'll have these moments of, of closeness with God. But it seems like sometimes what we see happening in the overall church is really just a general decay. And sometimes you can look into people's lives and you can see that as well. Asaph, as we go on to read here in verses 3 through 12, I want to try to read this quickly. What we see it was that he was starting to look at all that was going on around him. And what he was doing was personalizing everything he started to see as a personal offense. And he was starting to internalize all of these frustrations all of these disappointments and all of these confusions. He says, I was stumbling over what I saw the wicked doing. For when I saw the boasters with such wealth and prosperity, I became jealous over their smug security. Indulging in whatever they wanted, going where they wanted, doing what they wanted with no care in the world, no pain, no problems. They seemed to have it made. They lived as, as though life would never end. They didn't even try to hide their pride and their opulence. Cruelty and violence are part of their lifestyle. Pampered and pompous, vices ooze, oozes from their souls. They overflow with vanity. They're such snobs looking down their noses. They even scoff at God. They are nothing but bullies as they threaten God's people. They are loud mouths with no fear of God, pretending to know it all. Windbags full of hot air. Impressing only themselves, yet the people keep coming back to them to listen 
to more and more of their nonsense. They tell their cohorts, God will never know. See, he has no clue what's going on. These are the wicked ones I'm talking about. And they never lift a finger, living a life of ease while their riches multiply. And I don't know about you, but if you pay attention to our politics in our country at all, if you listen to the news at all, it's not hard to see that Asaph was looking at a world that was very similar to what we live in today in this way. Things that just don't make sense. People who claim they have all the answers, and yet nobody seems to ever really get to the answer. We know the answer. But so many want to skirt around the real answer, Jesus Christ. And I don't know if this strikes a chord with anybody today, but this was really starting to strike a chord with me when I read across this. And I know as Christians and as people who follow Jesus and are filled with His Spirit, we're supposed to get up every day and have a sunny disposition and come to church and smile at each other and, and love each other. And, and trust me, um, we do. I mean, God has been so good to put Lisa and I in a great church. And we experience love and we give love. And I see it here today. And that's so much a part of what we experience when we go to church. But I wonder if sometimes we just act like nothing in the world phases us. And I wonder if I'm the only one in the room who from time to time approaches the Lord and say, God, you know, I have some questions. I have some questions. Am I the only one who looks around and, and says, Lord, I thought that the fruit of obedient faithfulness would look a little bit different than this? It would look a little bit different than this thing that's happening in my life right now? And friends, as I said, I'm not here to diminish God's faithfulness. But sometimes, let's just be honest, life in this world gets heavy. Life in this world gets heavy. Do you know that's intentional? I, would, I was going to make the statement that the, the world was created to drain you and to run you down, but it really wasn't. Sin happened, but that is the plan of the enemy is to wear you down. The scripture in 1 Peter says he comes to steal, to kill, and destroy, right? But he's never as obvious as that. He's never as obvious as that. How does he steal, kill, and destroy? He doesn't just jump out from behind a bush and kick us in the gut and stab us with a knife and that's it. Because he knows we're too smart. We're looking for him behind many of us, every bush. He's not just going to come at us that way. But what he does through the daily events of the world and all of the concerns that are taking place, he wants to wear you down with concerns. And if you happen to be like me, who sometimes just can't get out of his own head, then you, you might have the problem that Asaph was having, who starts to internalize the things that we experience. So the world gets heavy and it starts to drain our souls. It starts to drain our souls. Political turmoil, racial turmoil, economic turmoil, international turmoil, philosophical turmoil, even just this whole thing about how to handle COVID. It's still not over. Friends, we have been in two and a half years of a global tragedy. It's not just this country or this group of people or just the church. or The entire world has gone through this tragedy that we're still working to come out of. It does something. In fact, psychologists are starting to come up, starting to see research and studies now. You know, there's that kind of uh, uh, term, uh, COVID brain. 
That's that we all kind of joke around and say, you know, I was kind of shut up in my house and, I've, and everything's kind of different now and I've got COVID brain. Psychologists are starting to see that it's actually a thing. They're starting to see studies that people's brains have literally begun to be rewired because of this, this thing that we've gone through together globally. And I've mentioned all of this stuff. Not to mention, you know, I haven't even gotten to the fact that we all have personal trials, personal struggles, relational struggles, financial struggles. You see, all of these, all of these big picture things that I was mentioning to you, this turmoil, these, these world events, this economic stuff, it all ends up somehow trickling down into our personal lives, doesn't it? We have to deal with the, the financial side of things, the inflation, the gas prices, uh, food shortages, toilet paper shortages, whatever it is. We've got to deal with it, right? It hits home. And, you know, and I, I'm, I'm joking, because, you know, because some of these things are not as big as we've turned them into. But they start to feel real to us. They start to feel real to us. And so what I want to do today is by the time I finish, and, and I try not to be long about doing this, but I'm going to share kind of my story, and I'm going to share three biblical truths, three biblical facts that I want to offer you because I want you to be able to hold on to something and take it home with you uh, as you leave today. And the first one that I want to share with you, it's the, well, let me make this statement first. I do believe we're living in the last days. I believe, and I'm going to be honest with you, and you may not think well of me for this, I just don't watch the news. I don't have to. Everybody around me is talking about it. Go to work, people are talking about it. You know, I, I've got people sending me the, the, the secondary news all the time. I know what's going on in the world. I'm aware of what's taking place, so I'm able to be prayerful about it, but I just stop because it's overwhelming. It started to overwhelm me. So I don't watch the news, but I know enough to know by what I can see in my community, by what I can see in our nation, by what I know of the scriptures and what I can see happening on the world landscape, we're living in the final days of time. Now, I don't know days, hours, stuff like that. Jesus doesn't even know that if you look at the scripture. So even the Son of Man doesn't know. But I'm going to tell you this. I know this is that in the, the final days, we are going to need resilience. We are going to need a resilience like probably none of us in, in our generations have ever needed before. I believe that God is a loving God. I've been experiencing that more and more. But you know what? That was part of my problem. Because when you get swept up in all this garbage, you start to let fear arise in your heart. You start to let troubles arise in your heart. And fear starts pushing out the love of God. But I don't think God is going to cause us to suffer. Now, if you feel like you need to store a few things up, if you need to store up a little food for some rough times, go ahead and do that. That's fine. But listen, our God has been in control of mankind since, since creation. He has put kings in place. He has taken kings out of place. He has caused nations to rise, nations to fall. Do you think he can't get us through three months or six months of a, of a little bit of a food shortage or whatever? God loves you, especially those who are his people. He loves you, but we are going to need some resilience. We're going to need some resilience. And you know, and here's the thing. Before sin and entered the world, we were all created to live in Eden. And because we are all part of that human 
family and part of that human line, there is something in all of us, in each one of us, as we watch our world kind of degrade and decline and things kind of shaping up the way that they're shaping up, there is something in each one of us that longs for Eden. Isn't there something in your heart that's just like, even now, you know, as we're trying to climb out of this COVID thing, aren't you still, don't you just find this little whisper in the back of your mind, you're still just kind of saying, man, I, I just can't wait until things get good again. I, think, I can't wait until things get back to the way they were when they were good. Whether it's a, and maybe you have a relational strain in your family or whatever, and you're just praying and longing, and you're just like, I can't wait until things are good again. We long for Eden, and yet we're surrounded by all of this turmoil, and that is what causes our souls to drain. It's hard to receive. What I want to say is resilience, the resilience we need is imparted to us by our Creator. Resilience comes from God. Strength, life comes from God. I'm not telling you anything that most of you don't know, but what I do want to tell you is that it's hard to receive anything when your hands are clenched tight with fear, it's hard to receive anything when your hands are clenched tight with frustration. It's hard to receive anything when your hands are clenched tight with disappointment or stress or shame, whatever it might be. Remember the parable in Jesus told in Matthew 25. It was the parable of the ten virgins. I'm going to try to read through here just part of it real quick. And I know growing up in church and just, it seems like the bulk of the teaching and the preaching that I had always heard on this parable, it was always kind of centered and couched in teaching around the end times, right? Because it was couched that way by Jesus in this conversation with his disciples. And, and the themes that I felt like I was always gleaning from these teachings and these presentations of this parable was that you better what better be alert, you better be awake, better be ready, right? Um, but let me just read this with you, and I want you to listen to see what this says, okay? Jesus said, then the kingdom of heaven, he's talking about what it's going to be like in the final days. The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and they went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, five of them were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here's the bridegroom, come out and meet him. Then those virgins rose and they trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourself. And while, while they were there going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterwards, the other virgins came out also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. And this is where we land this teaching usually watch therefore because you neither know the day or the hour and listen we need to be alert but we don't need to be alarmed I remember that when I very first and I was in the ministry for a long time before I first came to the realization that we were not supposed to be scared about Jesus' return <laughs> But he, he gives these teachings about, he, he, he explains all of the signs of the times and the, and the signs of the season and when he's coming. And what did he say? He said, encourage one another with these words. And most of my experience with teaching about the end times was anything but encouraging. 
And so I've really kind of taken up this cause lately because what's the point here in the parable of the virgins? Is it watch and be alert and pray? Hmm, it's there. We need to do that. But what's the point? Don't ever run out of oil. Don't ever run out of oil. And we know in Scripture that the oil is always a representation of the Holy Spirit. It's always a likeness of the Holy Spirit. And it just seems to me, you know, that the greatest threat to the church today is not a food shortage. The greatest threat to the church today is not world events. The greatest threat to the church today is not socialism. It's not liberalism. The greatest threat to the church today is not atheism. The greatest threat to the church today is that we'll be worn down by a pace of life and problems in this world and in our personal lives that we will lose our oil. You see, we shouldn't be concerned about running out of food. We should be concerned about running out of oil. And so, how do we do that? That's my second point. In order for us to be able to maintain the kind of oil that we need to have, we need to be able to bring the things that burden us or trouble us the most or are the heaviest things in our lives, and we need to bring them into the light. Bring them into the light. Whether it's your frustration about the way things are going, political things, I don't know, whatever. Maybe it's your finances, maybe it's bitterness, maybe it's discouragement, maybe it's confusion, maybe it's shame over failures and things that you tried to do. Listen, I've tried to step out and do some things in ministry that didn't work out so well, and I let myself get wrapped up in shame. When I should have been ashamed only if I didn't try. The enemy's really slick about how he attacks us. Like he, he, it's not always just the perversion. It's not always just the, 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 the first few sins that come into your mind when we talk about sin. He'll come in so, in such a sneaky, a sly kind of way, and, and you've got to be ready for that. But it's so much more difficult for him to do when you're full of oil. And so... We have to allow Jesus to remove everything out of us so that then he can put everything that needs to be there back into us, okay? And that's why it's important to bring these things into the light. I don't know about you, but as a Christian and as a minister, I didn't like to let people know about things that I was struggling with. I didn't like to, you know, let, let on that, you know, there was a, a battle that I was facing in my life. And you know what? That was, that's the biggest trick of the devil is for us to keep things quiet. And I'm not saying to go out and hang out your dirty laundry all over, but, man, to find the very small handful of people who are a little further along in their walk with you, that you know that you can trust your heart with and trust your life with and say, man, I am struggling. Even say, I'm struggling with what God is doing in my life. We've got to be able to bring the things that burden us out into the light. And this is what Asaph was doing here in Psalm 73. In his weakness and weariness, he brought his concerns and questions to God. And listen to verses 13 and 14. He said, I've been foolish to play. Well, he asked the question, have I been foolish to play by the rules and keep my life pure? Have I been foolish to follow God all these years? Here I am suffering, God, after, under your discipline, day after day after day. Was he under God's discipline? No. But, you know, when you're in these places, that's what it feels like. So Asaph is, is expressing how it feels. 
He says, I feel like I'm being punished all the day long. And basically what he's saying is, I'm starting to realize my life is just as frustrated and anxious as those around me who aren't even redeemed. And listen to his self-awareness as he admits the dark place he found himself in. Verses 15 and 16, if I had, if I had given in to my pain and spoken, if I had let come out of my mouth what I was really feeling, it would have sounded like unfaithfulness to the next generation. When I tried to understand it all, I, and I just couldn't. It was, it was too puzzling, too much of a riddle to me. And friends, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate Asaph's transparency and honesty. He was discouraged by what was happening in the world around him. He was uncomfortable with what was going on in his heart. And he realized that it was starting to create a space between him and God and his relationship with God. It takes integrity to be honest like that. It takes integrity to be able to be transparent like that. And I, but I'm going to tell you something. I believe there's healing in that kind of honesty. James 5, 16 you know, I love James 5, it talks about, you know, we're big healing people, right? Here as Pentecostals, you believe in healing? Amen. I do. I, I'm going to share something here in a little bit. We, we've seen some amazing things uh, just recently. But we're big healing people, and we, and we love James 5 because it says, you know, call the elders of the, of the church together, anoint them with oil, and they shall be healed. But we forget verse 16 right there. And it says, confess your sins one to another, and you shall be healed. And I've never really heard that discussed much in the church. And I started digging into that a little bit. And I was like, and obviously we know we kind of went through this phase in the church where accountable relationships are important, and they are. But I've come to personally understand this. It's like you've got to find someone who can help you understand what it is you're struggling with. Because a lot of the stuff that I'm going to share with you in a little bit, just a second, that I was struggling with, I thought I was struggling with A, and A was just really the symptom of something back here that I was not aware of. But as I started to share the heaviness on my heart, there was someone there who could reflect my conversation and my thoughts back to me to be able to help me to see them different. And all of a sudden, I started to see the real concerns. And, and which I'll share with you here in just a second. So, this kind of brings me to this place where I need to be a little transparent and uh, share my story with you. And I'm going to try to do this quickly. When Lisa and I left Prairie Temple back in 2010 to go to Carrollton, to go back to Carrollton, we got there at a time when the church was really going through a, a rough time. Um, attendance had dropped uh, from about 90 to 95 a year and a half previous to when we got there to about 35 people. And um, essentially what they had experienced was a church split. It, they didn't, you know, the church didn't divide and there wasn't a splinter church. And all the people didn't go to the same places, but pretty much everybody that left, they scattered and went different places. The difficulty was that other than one person, one individual, every, every board member, every ministry position, even the church secretary, they all left. There was just one left. And so when we got there, what what we were looking at was that the remaining members that were there were just in shock. In shock because it just had happened so quickly. Now, I'll be honest, Lisa and I, when we, uh, when we went there, we knew what we were getting into. We understood where things were. And, um, and so we had prayed through that. And we had asked God if we, this was the right thing for us to do, if we could be useful in this situation. And the Lord had made that evident that that was the case in many different ways. But by the time um, 
we got there on our first Sunday, the Lord had started to really speak to me and give me some very clear vision about the kind of church and what he, what he wanted to do there. And by the time I actually was in the pulpit there, it was almost so clear. It was like he had a blueprint drawn out for me of kind of what that church was to be like. It was ama- I've never really experienced anything like that before. And so the bulk of our ministry in the first year at Carrollton was basically kind of observing the landscape of what was really happening in the life of the church and in the life of the community just to see, you know, where things were and, and what needed to take place, along with tending to the hurt and the confusion and, and the, the sorrow and the hopelessness that overshadowed the remaining members of the congregation. And so um, we were constantly, constantly encouraging them with a message of hope that said, listen, God is not done with you yet. God is not done with you yet. So after the initial season of healing and restoration, we began to implement this vision that we felt like God had given us in some very intentional and some very purposeful strategies that to be honest with you, it was going to require change inside all of us. It wasn't going to be easy. And so the change that was going to take place, the, 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 the vision that was going to take place, that kind of centered around four basic principles, one being that we were going to be missions-minded, but we were also going to be mission-minded in our community, um, we understood that we had to get the church outside the church, reach both far and near. We, the, another principle was we are going to stay gospel-centered, but we needed to communicate the gospel in a way that would meet people where they are. didn't matter what their background was. didn't matter how, what their age was. If we were going to meet them where they were. It didn't really even matter if we were inside the church or outside the church. We're going to try to bring the gospel to them in a way that met them where they were. Another principle was that to do all of this stuff, we needed every member, every person that was in our congregation to embrace the biblical truth that all of us are ministers of the gospel. And you know what? They actually did it. I was shocked. <laughs> they, they, it took some time, but they started to do that. And so we set out to provide a path of discipleship that would prepare our folks to do just that. And then the undergirding thing, or you could say the overshadowing thing, or let's just say the all-encompassing thing that surrounded all of that was that we needed to be spirit-led and spirit-fueled. Spirit-led and spirit-fueled. We knew that we needed the presence of God in every meeting, in every service, in every outreach, in every discussion, in every room, in, in the lobby, inside the church, outside the church. We needed the presence of God because it, that's what changes lives, right? And so what resulted over the next few years was beautiful. We began to develop ministries that were really starting to have a real impact in and around our community, and the Lord started, started to add it to our numbers. Several young families with children began to attend the church, and it was so awesome because you could see that they were starting to experience God in new ways, deeper ways, life-changing ways. And, of course, along with that, we knew that, hey, we need to develop some strong youth and children's ministries. So we started to focus on that. Uh, a number of our folks who started to click that they needed to get involved in ministry uh, got involved in those areas. We actually, in time, were able to bring on uh, part-time youth pastors uh, for a season. And God was doing a great thing there. The missional message that we were trying to be very consistent with started to really expand into people's hearts. And it wasn't just a missional message, but it turned into a missions message. 
And so we began to strongly support several missionaries. Um, there was only one. I, and I thought back to all that, where it was when you guys left and my heart broke because at the time we got there, they were just supporting one missionary. And um, so we were able to see improvement there. We even planted a church by ourselves. Our church planted a church in West Ghana, or Ghana, uh, Ghana, West Africa, okay? Uh, Life Point Chapel. Uh, the Lord helped us to do that. And many other wonderful things started to take place, and we've started to grow inwardly and outwardly. And the climactic, um, one of the high points for us was Easter Sunday of 2013. We had 130 people in attendance. I, prob I don't know. I don't, it's, a, it's the most people I can remember ever seeing there. We had to drag chairs in from everywhere. We had people sitting in the lobby. Uh, it was amazing. We had baptisms that day of, from, the, from the real stuff, that, the good stuff that God was doing in people's lives. And, and then a kind of a climactic moment there, too, was in, in the summer of 2015. We had a, a team of 40 people come down from Calvary Church in Naperville. And they descended upon our church in a blitz of carpentry, electrical work, cabinetry, carpet laying, yard work, and they completely remodeled our entire church in one week. So when we left church one Sunday, all this craziness went on. We went back. It was like walking into an entire different place, and, and it was beautiful what they did, and it just felt so good that God was was not just doing the spiritual things, but it was kind of impacting some other things as well. I say that this was the climactic point because um, from my personal standpoint, it was shortly after this that I personally started to descend into a very long and slow spiral. And this is where it gets hard for me because I, I need to be a little transparent with you. Looking back now, I look back all, over everything that happened in those last seven years, I can probably shove everything that was going on into kind of two themes in my life. The first one is this, it's that I started to allow myself to be defined by my ministry. I see that now. I began to identify more with what more with what I was doing for Jesus than what by than the way I identified myself by who I was in Jesus. It took me a long time, it was a painful process to come to that realization. But listen, this is because ministers often invest so much of themselves in kingdom work and into carrying the burdens of other people. Sometimes it's really, it's hard, difficult to find, to understand that gray area from when you realize you're doing the work of the ministry and then all of a sudden, the, you know, all of a sudden you think, oh, this is who I am because this is what I do. And so this led me straight to the next trap because how many of you know that a life in ministry, just like life in any other area, is filled with blessings and joyous things, but it was also fraught with pitfalls, trials, and disappointments. Things that probably, again, I know that they were bigger to me because I was internalizing them than probably anybody else even saw. But when you're where I was at that point in my life, this is disastrous. It's a disaster waiting for somebody whose identity is wrapped up in their ministry. Because, which leads us to the second theme, over the next several years, Lisa and I started to experience both personal and ministry losses and disappointments that directed me to a really just a scary place in my heart. Uh, some of these were emotional losses. Some of them were relational losses. Some of them were financial losses things that took place. There were some physical trials that each of us had to deal with along the way. And it wasn't that any of them, except for one of them, one of them was kind of a major deal. 
but none of them were so huge and so life-changing that you couldn't overcome them and get around them. But friends, I'm just telling you, it just came wave after wave after wave after wave for seven years. For seven years. I know what you're thinking. But Scott, just pray. But Scott, you needed to be in the Word. But Scott, God is faithful. Friends, I'm telling you, I was praying. I was in the Word. I was doing everything that I could to hear from God. And it, God got so silent in my life. And, which actually started me to asking more questions. And I started just to wonder what was going on. Had I disappointed Him? Had I failed Him? And there, the next layer of shame began just to wrap around my life. I kind of got to a place where... In spite of all of this, I don't know how, but things were really going well in the church. There was a point about a year, probably a year and a half before we finally we resigned that uh, I don't even remember what happened. Something took place, and it was a struggle. And Lisa and I, we sat at Noodles and Company in Springfield one night talking about how we were going to resign and from my plan to get out of this mess. That didn't happen, thankfully. And God started to do some great things that I started to see take place in people's lives. It wasn't numerical stuff, but it was just spiritual growth that was taking place. And I started to kind of get some new energy from that. And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting my second or third win, getting ready, you know, for another however many years. This is awesome. This is beautiful. But the, something strange happened at that time. And that vision that was so clear and everything, that blueprint, in my mind's eye, it rolled up like a scroll and disappeared. And I was like, oh, God, what are you doing? And... Again, we, I went through another season of silence, such silence. And uh, I got to be distraught and confused about why God wouldn't show me a way out. And I'm just going to confess to you, because confession is healing. My soul was becoming diminished. Diminished. There's something about that word, diminished. Because it's not like being in a car wreck where you just walk away crippled. Diminished speaks of the effects of just that wave after wave after wave of hardship and trial. And, and you know, you're reaching out and you're just not able to seem to kind of find those. It's that ongoing wearing away of your soul and your spirit. And... There's something about that word. Being diminished is to, it's defined by to make less or to cause to appear less. Diminishment is the opposite of resilience that I spoke of earlier when I said that we need resilience. And God was faithful because I began to realize, began to understand because when we left and we resigned, we were the saddest people on the planet. We did not want to leave Carrollton. We loved those people. They loved us. I was in depression probably for six months after we left. Couldn't understand why all this was taking place, but we knew, we knew that we were where we were because God put us there, and it was just like, okay, Lord, Explain, explain, explain. And so the explanation was, this isn't punishment. This is a rescue. This is a rescue mission. Not only was he rescuing my soul, but he, he was also providing in one of those other, other areas of disappointment and loss that... Um, hit us so hard and the Lord said the reason 
he's, and he's really recently just begun to really show me this clearly, the reason that you've been struggling, it's not because you're full of sin. It's not because you're not seeking me. It's not because I don't love you. He, he spoke to me in so many different ways through prophetic words people share with me at church, through podcasts, through books, through the scripture, these, these different moments in time. But it was so hard for me to grasp. And finally he said, the problem is, Scott, is that our union is broken. It's not that I'm not here and you're not there and that I don't love you and that you don't love me. It's just that our union is broken. And so it's difficult for that flow of oil to flow into your life. So that's point number three. Cultivating union with Jesus is the most important thing that any of us will ever do. Cultivating union with Jesus is the most important thing that any of us will ever do. Now, this is where this gets tricky because I told you that I was reading scripture. I told you I was studying scripture. I told you that I was leaning in in prayer and seeking God. And that sounds like, why don't you get the answers? How could the union be broken? Those things are not the answer. Those things point to the union of God, with God. They, they assist, they are implements that guide us towards the union with God. But if we just get stuck in this routine of this is what I do and this, you know, and I, and I sat down for this many minutes or hours and I was in God's word or I was in prayer and we don't really stop. Because I don't know about you, but when most of my prayer, it kind of started to be a laundry list of this wave of stuff. And it's like, God help, God help, God help, God help. And the union with God is not God help. The union with God is Jesus, I just need to sit here with you and let you love me. And let you love me. And tell you how much I love you. And I think what was happening is I was rarely getting to that point. Because I was like, help me, help me, help me. God, what's going on in Ukraine? Help, help, help. God, what about this election? Help, help, help. God, what about this thing going on in my community? Help, help, help. These people are saying, help, help. And all that's appropriate, right? We believe in intercessory prayer. We believe in the power of intercessory prayer. But all of that is secondary to when you sit down in your quiet place and you sit there until you can quiet your mind you quiet your mind to the point where you can say, Lord, I give everything and everyone over to you. All the world problems, all the national problems, I give it over to you. I can't take it anymore. I can't carry it anymore. It's too heavy. I give it over to you. The personal problems, the financial problems, the... The, the whatever, relational problems, the ministry problems. I can't carry it anymore. Lord, I give everyone and I give everything over to you. And we know from John, John 15, right? I was going to read it, but for the sake of time, I'm not. About the importance of being grafted into the life of the vine. The Passion Translation, he uses the words life union. That's why it meant so much to me. He said, stay in this life union with me and you'll be amazed at how my life will flow back into you. But I'm going to tell you something. If your devotional time is not working, up for you, working out for you, friends, to where you're feeling the life of Jesus on a daily basis, to where you can get up with fuel for that day or to face what you're facing, don't, number one, don't get up. But number two, do something different. Change it up. Do something different. It's okay. It's okay. What matters is, is that you meet with him and that that union is restored and reconnected and in a healthy place. And 
that's what's been going on in my life. And I know, like I said, like we've weathered a lot of things. And people are like, why would you resign? Why would you go to Kentucky? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'll let you know when I find out. Well, I've just found out. I've just found out. And I just found out not too long before you texted me, Debbie. And that's why I, I really was like, am I re really ready to preach this message yet? Am I really ready to share this with people? I think I need to see the proof in, my, in the pudding for a little bit. But God says share it. Frankly, uh, we just didn't understand, but we knew that it was God's leading in his direction, and now we're starting to see God has put us in a good place. And he started to gather our kids back around us within arm's length, so to speak. And... Um, Obviously, we have a grandbaby now who is, is the best grandchild ever, right? <laughs> <laughs> but in a good church with people who love us and have loved us like we've been there all of our, all of our entire lives from the very time we stepped foot in that church. And we have seen miracles God is doing some great things in our church. There's a hunger that's there that's building, that's building and building and building. And we have seen some miraculous things take place. Lisa had a miraculous healing um, uh, that I'm going to share with you or have her share with you if she wants in a minute because I want her to pray with you, some of you today, uh, and experience the things that we've been experiencing but I'm in a place now where God is teaching me a new rule for life and a new order for life. Reteaching me. I've had to go back. I feel like I had to go back to beginner Sunday school class again. And it's, it's, it makes me ashamed to have to say these things. But you know what? I'd rather humble myself and admit kind of what was been developing in my life on the chance that it could just help one person who might be kind of in the same kind of place that I was. You don't have to be in ministry to have these kinds of attacks. And so I want to I want to leave you with these last thoughts. My the focus of my daily prayer life is Jesus, heal and restore my union with you. Heal and restore my union with you. I need to feel that that flow of oil again, that flow of life again. And part of what I learned that I have to do is what I spoke of just a moment ago. And it's what, what's what John Eldridge, he, I don't know how many of you have read some of his books, but he calls benevolent detachment. And it's where you get in that quiet place. We've got this little place. It's our walk-in closet in our apartment, and it has this little turn in it. And it's very small compared to the rest of the closet and it's where my clothes go okay but it's this there's no room for anything else but there's this little nook there and it's kind of dark in there and I know it sounds ridiculous but I go back and I sit on the floor in the little nook and I'll close the door so the dog can't get to me and that's where I'm creating my new rule of life. A new rule for living. And some of you may need to do that. And when you come to that point where you recognize that you need a rule for, new rule for life, you, what you're recognizing is that I need some radical change in my life. I need some radical changes in my life to be where I, where I can be well and whole. To be where God wants me to be. So be willing to do that. Part of that is practicing benevolent detachment and saying, you know what, Jesus, I give everything and everyone over to you. I can't carry all the problems of everyone around me. I can't carry the problems of this country. I'm concerned. I'm knowledgeable. I'm alert. I mean, I, look, I'm not saying disengage from prayer over the abortion issue. Abortion issue. That's, that's still, even though Roe v. Wade was a victory, that's still a fire storm, right? 
I'm, I'm not telling you to disengage in prayer over the political landscape and, and what's taking place in our nation or around the world and things in Ukraine. I'm not asking you to disengage with any of that stuff. We're called to pray and be engaged in the world and that stuff, but put it down for a while and let Jesus carry it for you. Put it down for a while. And before the worship team comes back and before we kind of go into a time where I would just like to pray with any of you here today that might be struggling in a similar situation. I'm not here to say that I've got this great anointing and something amazing is going to happen, but I just feel like this is what I need to do to be obedient. And I feel like I want Lisa to pray with anybody here today over here that might have a physical affliction, something physical going on that you might need a physical healing. Do you want to share this or do you want me to? Okay. Because just a few weeks ago in service, uh, she received a miraculous healing. And uh, I kind of want her to tell you about that to kind of set this moment up. But we want to pray with you because I believe... There's a reason we were asked, and there's a reason that God said yes, and there's a reason that we're here. It's for you. So um, I had an ACL injury about in April of 2021, <laughs> and I tore my ACL completely, and there's a lot that went into that, and God just really supplied, and he supplied a great surgeon for me. But that is a tough recovery if you've ever had to go through it. Um, a lot of therapy. I was in therapy for 10 months. The surgeon told me it would be 18 months probably before your knee feels normal. And it may never feel completely normal, right, because you've got a cadaver <laughs> tendon in there or whatever, ligament. So, um, you know, I was back to doing my normal things. You know, I like to exercise. I was doing all that. But, man, there was always this tightness and this pain that would just be there and twitch. And I was like, God, just why, why isn't this being healed, right? And so we had a service, I don't know, it was back in September, I think. And I hadn't, you know, I think sometimes as pastors and, and that, sometimes you don't go forward as much as what other people do. <laughs> you know, usually praying for other people or whatever. And I sat there for the longest time, and I felt the Holy Spirit tell me that I needed to ask for prayer for my knee. That it would just, the tendon was really tight, my hamstring was really tight that day. I mean, I have a hard time with standing up during a worship service because it would start bothering me. So I went forward, and you know, I think a lot of us do that, this because I do hear many of us pray this way. God, would you just heal me? I'm asking you to heal me. I'm, I'm doing this. And you know, this person that was praying with me reminded me that we need to pray with authority. Over, not God would you, or God please. Because in Isaiah it says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his stripes we are healed. Amen. We are healed. Not heal me, but we are healed by what he's already done. And they reminded me, you need to pray with authority. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, heal me now. You've given it to me. And you know, I started praying that, and that hamstring just started to loosen. And my feet weren't, they weren't the same length like my leg because of what had happened. And you could just see my foot just come out and become even with my other leg. But again, it comes down to, I think it's how we pray. It's almost like we're begging God. We don't need to beg God. He's already done it for us. And that really spoke to me. And I have to remember that. So I'm not saying that, oh, I didn't have any twinges a little bit. But you know what? I went for a walk every day, three times a day. I, I walk and then I exercise. And when I would feel that, it was like Satan trying to take that away what God was doing. And I would be even in my shower. I would be on the walk with the dog. I, people probably saw me and thought I was nuts. 
And I said it aloud, because I think there's something about saying things aloud. And as I was walking around the park, I was like, Satan, you have no authority. Jesus has started a healing work in my knee, and he's going to complete it. And I did that for days and weeks over the past four or five weeks. And you know what? Sometimes I start to feel that come up on me again. I'm like, oh, no, you still don't have authority here. And I think we all need to learn not to beg God, but to take what he's already, we are healed. That means we're healed not only in the body, but we're healed spiritually, we can be healed. Where there's fractured relationships, all of that can take place. So I, I don't know how you folks close. I am mindful of the time and all that goes with that. I'm going to ask the praise team if they would want to come and just sing that song, I Speak Jesus, again. I'm going to ask Lisa if she would just be over here on this side, and if you need a physical touch, she'll anoint you with the... We're not trying to come in here and sound like, oh, we've got this thing now, and we're just going to... But I just felt like God said, you know, let's just, just be used. So I'm going to ask her to do that. I'm going to come down here if... If you're at a place where, kind of like where I was, I'm not saying that you're lost. I'm not saying you're away from God to the point that you're not saved. I'm just saying you're enveloped in, in discouragement, disappointment, anything. Uh, I just want to pray with you for freedom and victory in your life today. And uh, that's what we need to do. We need to speak the name of Jesus into these things, right? And so um, let's just do that today. Listen, if any of you, f if you need to leave or, or whatever, I'm not going to be offended. You don't feel like you got to stay because of that. I, we understand, but we just want to see the Lord do what he needs to do uh, in your lives today. We speak your name in every situation. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power, and your name is healing, your name is life. You break every stronghold, you shine through the shadows, you burn like a fire. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over fear and all anxiety to every soul held captive by depression I speak Jesus because your name is power your name is healing, your name is life. You break every stronghold, you shine through the shadows, 
You burn like a fire, shout Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name. Jesus, shout Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name. Jesus, your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life. You break every stronghold, you shine through the shadows. You burn like a fire, your name is power. Your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life. You break every stronghold, you shine through the shadows. You burn like a fire. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I Jesus, I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind, because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you, holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up my eyes in wonder, show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those. sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none 
beside you open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me surely there is no one like you there is none beside you open up Jesus, the name above every 
every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes.
Here is where I lay it down. You are all I'm chasing now. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down. You are all I'm chasing now. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. And I will make room for you to do whatever you want to. To do whatever you want to. And I will make room for you to do whatever you want to.
He says, press in more and you'll have it. He says, don't give up. Don't give in. Have you made room in your heart for him today? Every moment, every bit of your being, make room for him, because he's what it's all about. We are nothing without him, but with him we are everything.